Ian Huntley was a manipulative charmer with the gift of the gab and a hidden past. He's an angry, sexually frustrated man who has an attraction to young girls, of that is no doubt. He enticed, bullied and lied his way through life. Some people have likened him to a Pied Piper. He was a predatory paedophile and murderer who masked his true motives when he took a job as a school caretaker. There is no doubt that Holly and Jessica were two vibrant, happy little girls, um, full of life. Tonight, we get inside the mind of Ian Huntley, a man who killed two innocent young girls in The Making of a Monster. As a forensic psychologist, I've spent the last 10 years working in prisons and maximum security hospitals, analysing the behaviour of murderers, rapists and paedophiles, trying to understand what makes somebody capable of a truly monstrous act of violence. To try to unravel the psychological profiles of dangerous convicts, Kerry has spent a decade researching and interviewing the most violent killers and criminals in Britain. In tonight's programme, she looks into the mind of a man who killed two innocent young girls and burnt their bodies in an attempt to hide his terrible crime. Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman were just 10 years old at the time they were murdered by Ian Huntley. Here to discuss the case with me tonight are Dr David Holmes, a fellow forensic psychologist, and Mark Williams-Thomas, a former detective and one of the country's leading experts in child protection. But first, let's find out more about the crime. It was a warm summer evening in August 2002, and best friends Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman put on their new red Manchester United football shirts and posed for a picture. The Wells were having a barbecue with family and friends. It was a happy occasion, the last one they were ever to enjoy together. Shortly after dinner, Holly and Jessica snuck out of the house to buy sweets. It wasn't until the visitors to the Wells family were due to go home that Mr and Mrs Wells discovered that both girls were not in the bedroom, that they thought they were upstairs. As they passed Huntley's house in College Close, he invited them in, claiming that Maxine Carr, his fiancée, who was known to the girls through her work at their school, was also at home. In fact, Carr was away visiting relatives at the time. Within a short time of Holly and Jessica entering the house, Huntley had murdered them. Later that evening, their frantic parents reported the two girls missing. It was out of character for Holly to go out without saying anything. And by 10 o'clock, obviously the anxiety levels were very high. The search, involving hundreds of volunteers, continued well into the next day and lasted 13. Several witnesses came forward, including Huntley. He claimed he'd seen the girls shortly before their disappearance. It doesn't help the fact that I was one of the last people to speak to them, if not the last person to speak to them. Um, I keep reliving that conversation and thinking perhaps something different could have been said. Perhaps get them here a little bit longer and maybe changed events. To eliminate Huntley from their inquiries, the police searched his home and the school where he worked. They found nothing to link him to the girls. During the early days in the police search for the two missing girls, one of the singular aspects was, of the case was the fact that Huntley was making himself known to officers who were involved in Soham. He would approach officers whose duty was to uh, guard the cordon perhaps around the school and he would ask them questions, things like, how long do DNA profiles take to come back from the laboratory? Huntley's unusual interest attracted the attention of police investigators, so they carried out a second search. The school was sealed off for the search the school. In fact, it was very strange arriving because there was helicopter overhead and heat searching people and people in white suits and people in black suits. And this was this this is my my school. I still can't get my head around it. Really. You, this place that you know very well suddenly became horrific. I knew what they were looking for. They were looking for the girls. This time, they found significant clues in the storage building at the school where Huntley worked. 
They found the half-burnt remains of Holly and Jessica's Manchester United shirts. It was the breakthrough the police were looking for. And the following day, on the 17th of August, they arrested Huntley and his girlfriend Carr on suspicion of murder. When Huntley and Carr had been taken in for questioning, and my heart really, to say my heart sunk wouldn't do it justice really, it's got wrenching really, to, because I, you'd never believe somebody you know um, could be anywhere near something like this, and, and I hadn't thought that. The very same day they were arrested, the worst fears of the police and the families were realised. Almost two weeks after the girls first disappeared, their bodies were found near RAF Lakenheath, an airbase near to Huntley's home. Mark, this story is going to keep parents awake at night. But actually, how rare is it for an acquaintance to kill a child? Well, a stranger to kill a child is very, very rare. You know, there's only seven children every year who are killed and um, having been abducted by predatory paedophiles. But of course, we perceive it through the media eye, is that there are strangers out there abducting children left, right and centre. Mm -hmm. The reality is far from it. Two children die a week at the hands of somebody known to them. But so we make the comparison with a stranger very, very rare. And one of the problems following on from what Mark just said is that the media then fuel a myth i.e. that most paedophiles and people who strike against children uh, are strangers, which means that the focus of attention for many parents, etc., is outside the home, amongst strangers, whereas in fact they, you would have far more success if you look back into the home to family members, to people who have got close access to your children. Absolutely. Well, Ian Huntley was acquainted, wasn't he, with the mm -hmm. victims. Do you think that he had pre-planned in any way the events of that day? Often with people who predate on children, it is a lifelong characteristic. It is not suddenly so, something that has suddenly come upon them, or they've suddenly developed. Um, there will be a history. You will be able to sort of audit their life and find incidents all the way through. So therefore, it would not be an entire coincidence uh, that these two young girls were brought into contact with Huntley um, and that he would have encouraged that and taken his opportunity. He may have tried to befriend them, he probably tried to befriend other children in the opportunistic way that he may then have access to them. But these weren't so much opportunistic in so much as they weren't complete strangers. He knew them. He knew the, 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 both of them through, of course, Maxine Carr. So he had that point of contact straight away in which he may able to get the dialogue with them. He's a, he was a paedophile. His history is he is sexually interested in young children, and, and particularly those really between the ages of 10 and, and 15. But that was his interest, and therefore both of these girls fell into that area for him. And as with most paedophiles, it's around crisis points in his life. And he was at a point of crisis in relation to Maxine Carr. He had the fear that she was going to leave him. Well, apparently, he had an argument with Maxine Carr shortly before the girls knocked on his door. So was this just a really tragic case of the girls appearing in the wrong place at the wrong time? I think that would be attributing too much to circumstance, because needless to say, you know, anyone who has you know, a terrible row and with, you know, feels distraught and alienated from the person they're closest to does not immediately turn around and start killing children. Um, it has to take a certain type of person who perhaps has gone to the brink of this before, uh, who has actually, perhaps in fantasy even, gone to the brink of this many times before. And that, of course, would needless to say be the circumstantial um, trigger. Um, but without his predilection, the this would not be the case. We don't know what took place within that room, in, in particularly the bathroom, where um, you know, he gives his account of how they came to their death. But the problem is you can't believe anything that Ian Huntley has said throughout the whole of his uh, how, throughout the whole of investigation because he's a liar. You know, he's an impulsive liar and very, very good at it as well. Well, actually, let's talk about his lying because he put himself out there for the media, didn't he? There was a huge search for these children and he was really at the forefront of it, giving interviews. He must have had some idea that people from his past were maybe going to come forward. Why do you think he did that? Um, I think he was driven to go public, uh, not to confess to this, but to present themselves as a, a, a caring person who would never do this, who is interested in the case. Um, look at me, I am a, a good member of the community, I am doing the right thing. In some way, it gives them some kind of cloak uh, of uh, impenetrability as far as um, 
people thinking evil well, of them. I think, them. That, I think to a degree that's true, but actually what it was, was by ingratiating himself within the investigation, he could do that because he was a caretaker of the school, he got knowledge of the investigation and the questions that he started to ask the police officers enabled him to form his answers and the way that he presented himself. So it wasn't so much about saying, you know, I'm going to put myself on public and show myself to be a fantastic person. What he was constantly doing is saying, what can I find out about that police investigation will enable me not to be caught? So he was just desperately trying to cover his tracks at that point? Absolutely. We know he covered his tracks because we know that he, got dis he had a conversation about DNA and whether or not DNA fibres can be taken from clothing. He went back to the scene and that's afterwards he burned the bodies. And that's having had that conversation with the police. So we know that he took certain steps to try and eliminate evidence having been found that out from the police. I've worked with two cases of child killers who've then involved themselves in the search and having spoken to them they told me that that gave them a real feeling of excitement they used to go back to the body when there was breaks in the search and they used to think well I know something that nobody else knows and I know the answer to the question that everybody's asking at the moment and it added to their sexual excitement and most child killings by a stranger have a sexual element don't yes, they? they do and certainly in this case he obviously did get some kind of enjoyment from being involved in the news story uh, and projecting himself forward um, to my mind I think there may be an element that also you give yourself a certain amount of protection I am one of you lot looking for the killer rather than being the killer therefore you know that gives me some protection from being actually accused or being you know in, in the, the target um, sites of the police um, so it kind of works in both ways. Also give him something to do because if you, if you were a killer in that situation with the, with the lights on you uh, and, and in the actual area and not doing anything I think the level of anxiety and frustration would build up. And you well, may we don't do know why he, why he ingratiated himself to the degree that he did, and there's lots of children killers who haven't done that. He was there, he was in such a focal point within this community, being, being the person, not only the last person to see the girls, but also the person that joined in and assisted in the early days of the search. He, he took the police officer to where he wanted to take her, and, and didn't search some of the other areas, particularly the bin where the, the burnt clothing was found later. So he controlled that f right from the very beginning. And of course, by controlling that, he wanted to control the media as well. So the whole thing was about his control of the whole situation. Yes, he may well have got enjoyment out of it. Yes, he may well have got you know, some kind of sexual, sexual uh, excitement out of it all. But I think the main reason that he ingratiated himself to the degree that he was because he had control. Well, of course, the police didn't know about Huntley's background at that point. Had they known more about his background, I'm sure that he would have been very firmly in their sights. After the break, we'll take a look at Huntley's history. In August 2002, Ian Huntley killed two young girls, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. Their bodies were found in a ditch just a few short miles from their homes in Soham, Cambridgeshire. Ian Kevin Huntley was born in 1974 into a working class home near Grimsby, Humberside. He didn't seem to have a terribly happy or settled childhood. He was bullied at school, he got the nickname Spadehead and apparently also reacted quite violently to the bullying, so much so that at the age of 13 he was actually moved and had to start afresh at a new school and from, again from what we read things were no more settled when he arrived there. He left school with five GCSEs and was keen to get out of the classroom and begin earning money. When he was 20 he embarked on a whirlwind romance and married within weeks. The marriage lasted only a couple of months before his bride left him for his younger brother. On the rebound, Huntley sought comfort with a number of young girls. And like so many paedophiles, he weaved an elaborate web of intrigue and fantasy to attract them into his bed. Huntley told people that he'd been in the RAF and had to leave or was thrown out on health grounds. He'd also told people that his father had died and he'd told other people that he was training as a bodybuilder. All of this seems to have been part of the fantasy or the fantasy world he surrounded himself with and perhaps that was perhaps why some people were attracted to him. Rebecca Bartlett was 17 when she fell for Huntley but his charm soon turned to violence and he began to cheat on her with girls who were even younger. Yeah, yeah he definitely does like his young hands. 
because he knows that he can tell them what to do and they won't say no, or maybe they don't say no. Because like I didn't, when he was telling me to do things, I used to do it because I was scared. One of Huntley's earliest victims was a girl just 11 years old. He took her to this orchard in Cleethorpes and subjected her to a sexual attack that lasted for more than three hours. Due to lack of evidence, police investigations were dropped, leaving Huntley free to attack again. Huntley had a, a, a desire to control people that he came into contact with. He's an angry, sexually frustrated man who has an attraction to young girls, of that is no doubt. In 1998, Huntley was investigated for indecent assault and for rape. An 18-year-old claimed Huntley followed her home from a Grimsby nightclub to this underpass where he viciously raped her. Again, the case never proceeded to court. Around this time, he met 22-year-old Maxine Carr at a nightclub. Within weeks, they had moved in together. Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr did meet in the North East and they did form a relationship. And from all accounts, that was quite a turbulent relationship. Huntley was capable of being violent and certainly people who knew the couple felt that all wasn't well, even at that early stage. The couple moved to Cambridgeshire in 2001. Carr got a job as a teaching assistant at the local primary school and Huntley got a job as caretaker at Sowen Village College. The first I uh, met Ian Huntley when we interviewed for our site officer. He was very polite during the interview, and actually when he came to work with us as well, he was keen to please. Throughout his seven or eight months with us, his, um, he was calm, there was no loss of temper from him. He was, um, the, the only communication I got from parents were very positive, to say thank you, he helped find my daughter's shoes or my son's pee kit or something. So how can someone who seems so normal kill two young girls? Ian Huntley seems to have had a miserable childhood and a frustrating adulthood. Does that give us any clues into how he became a murderer? David, looking at Huntley's background, it seems to me that he has many of the classic characteristics of a psychopath. I think if you're looking at his early history, yes, he, he, was a, he was a bully, he was bullied, he was a loner, he was isolated from others, he could have been marginally paranoid in his reaction to others, um, he was very begrudging, and, and as, he, as he got older, he got more and more sort of like manipulative and controlling, which is a primary characteristic of psychopathy. Um, and perhaps he, yes, he, he, he developed into quite a, a, an accomplished liar, um, but you must sort of remember that most uh, paedophilic individuals, people who engage in paedophilic activity often do develop into extremely good liars because they have to cover their tracks constantly throughout their lives. Let me just pick up on that. So we're talking about him as a paedophile. Now when I assess clients, something that I look at is whether they are a primary paedophile or a secondary paedophile. So a primary paedophile to me is somebody who has got a sexual orientation that is primarily towards children. If they had a choice of who they were going to have sexual relationships with, it would be children. Actually, many of the men that I assess are secondary paedophiles, and the reason why they offend against children, and Huntley, we think, was linked with um, attacks on women from 11 to, to 19, is because they're easier to manipulate, aren't they? They're easier to control. Children, by their very nature, are vulnerable, aren't they? You know, all children are some children clearly more vulnerable than others and they get targeted and they get targeted tend to be through a grooming process where, where the offender identifies so more of a grooming rather than a predatory now a predatory obviously someone who is who doesn't need to go through the grooming process because they take the risk and ultimately majority of pre predatory paedophiles will kill the child in relation to Huntley Huntley's you know we must remember that the past behavior is, is, in, is indicative of future behavior and this is exactly what he presented himself he presented himself to be a paedophile a predatory paedophile who targeted individuals he had a long history of unlawful sexual intercourse rape all of these offences that were never prosecuted enabled him to have that opportunity often to continue. Often against strangers, often against girls who were returning home from nightclubs. Mm. Now in this case, this was two girls who knew who he was. Mm. He'd built a new life for himself in mm. Soham. Mm. Did he kill them because he knew he couldn't possibly get away with it if he didn't? 
Britain. Well, he, he had the access and the opportunity. He knew the girls. He enabled the girls to come into his, apart, into his house. I don't believe the girls went banging on his door. He encouraged the girls into his house. And the lure to get them into the house was Maxine Carp. His story they gave in court was clearly not correct. You know, the girls didn't accidentally fall in. One of them fall into the bath and the other one, you know, he quietened down. Uh, that didn't happen. We don't know what took place within that room, but the chances are it was the most horrendous of offences that the only way that he could end up dealing with it, because otherwise the girls would have talked and said who it was, was to kill them. And of course he'd been in contact with the police before on numerous occasions. Mm. He'd once been charged with rape, but it never actually led to any, any prosecution. So he was aware of the process that he could go through, he had some knowledge, so you can imagine why he wanted to destroy forensic evidence, can't yeah. you? I mean, it's what we call forensic awareness. Um, in other words, as you become entangled with the police procedure and you realise the kind of thing that's going to uh, tra entrap you, um, then you, in future behaviour, you're much more careful, you destroy evidence, etc. Even evading suspicion, um, because they know what attracted attention previously. And, and that kind of forensic awareness was obviously elevant, uh, very evident in Huntley, and it was very evident in how he dealt with the police, very manipulatively, police officers but it, but it themselves. But it wasn't he wasn't forensically aware, which is why he had to go back to the scene. No, no, what, he he committed. I mean his... he, 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 in general, he was becoming more aware of how, not on the specifics of this case, you know, by getting the feedback of exactly what they knew, but in terms of what police do, how police will detect you, how police will um, assess you or, or, or view you and, and view you as a suspect. People are aware because it's now broadcast, it's written about all the time. He was aware, and it would have been across the media. You know, they're looking to try and build up a DNA profile. They're looking to try and find the, you know, the items of clothing that was worn, what was done. So he would have been aware just by simply listening to that. And that didn't take the fact that he was involved in the police previously. Well, I think if he hadn't been involved with the police previously, he would have made many more mistakes, to be honest. One of the greatest tools that he used to manipulate the police was Maxine Carr, wasn't it? Mm. What do we know about his relationship with Maxine? Well, we can see evidently she is a bit childlike. In Obviously, from all reports we've got, from what we can believe, uh, she was in fact bullied by him. Uh, and he exerted massive amounts of pressure on her. And crucially, needless to say, he managed to manipulate her into giving him an alibi at the critical stage that he needed one in order to avert police suspicion. And that, we think, may be due to duress but also due to manipulation, careful manipulation, saying, I have previous offences, if you do not do this, then I will be dragged through the, the law, I will be um, falsely accused of this, that and the other, it will be terrible, so therefore you must do this, with an, probably with an element of threat. So Maxine Carr, if you like, was the weak link in this particular chain between police and Huntley, a suspect. I think to come back, Huntley made masses of mistakes. The, the, the thing was, is he wasn't on the radar because the system had failed to put him on the radar by the police. Had the police had the information about his previous um, in involvement with them and his previous offences, he would have been straight on the radar, they'd have searched his house straight away and they'd have got all the evidence. So he made masses of mistakes. So if you say that the base is that he was forensically aware, then why on earth did he keep all his clothing? Why on earth did he have the contact of the bag? Why did he put all his stuff? He was aware to an extent and I think that is indicative of his background. Do you think that partly it was just arrogance, he thought that he could get away with it? Because let's face it, he'd got away with an awful lot, hadn't he, up to that date? Mm. I think he did think he could get away with it. I think he thought he had a grip on the situation. He could manipulate the entire police investigation away from himself by using Maxine Carr and by controlling the evidence and also by ingratiating himself to the police. And he thought he was, had a, a primary source of information from them that he could help to, 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 to inform himself, to keep himself away from any kind of suspicion. And to some degree, how on earth he thought that his past would not catch up with him uh, is, is quite well, remarkable. Why was, why was Holly and Jessica going to be any different than any of other victims? Why was it going to be any different? Yes, OK, he killed them, but he'd got away with all the offences before. The authorities, the police, social services had already been involved before, and they'd never had any evidence on him to charge him. So why was this going to be any different? He was just going to simply get Maxine Carr to lie for him, and he would have been exactly the same, and the police would have moved on. And, of course, he needed to control that situation to try and stop it from happening. And that's when he put himself into the firing line. And, of course, when you stand up and you start talking, you know, 
and what, of course, was his downfall, was that it went national. People phoned up and said, this is what you know about him. And that was a breakthrough the police had, because until that stage, he was just the same as anybody else. And we must remember that the, the police would have worked on the basis, as did the large majority of the members of the public, that somebody with this background like that surely wouldn't be a caretaker of a school. Ian Huntley isn't the only example of a paedophile who was killed after a series of offences against children. After the break, we'll take a look at some other high-profile cases. Tonight we're examining the case of Ian Huntley. The Sower murders generated a huge amount of press coverage. But there have been other high-profile cases of child killing over recent years. So what, if anything, do these cases have in common? And what could trigger a crime of this nature? One of the most famous cases happened in 2000. It began on a summer's evening when Sarah Payne was playing with her two brothers in a field close to their grandparents' home. She'd been playing at her grandparents with her brothers and with some of the children. And she'd, she'd knocked herself and decided to walk back to her parents' home. But unfortunately, Sarah had disappeared and nobody saw her again. The brothers did see a van driving past them that seemed to be driving too quickly and they recollected that the driver was grinning at them. Unknown to the boys, the man behind the wheel had just abducted Sarah. It was the last time that anyone saw her alive. After 16 days, the police found the body of a girl partially buried in a field close to the A29 road in West Sussex. I think Sarah's body was, was identified primarily through a DNA profile, there was a milk tooth which Sarah's mother had saved. Um, that also gave a profile and also a hair that uh, had been taped from um, the, the perpetrator's uh, clothing. On the 7th of February 2001, Roy Whiting was remanded in custody after being formally charged with the kidnapping and murder of Sarah Payne. Heavy police security was needed as a large crowd besieged the courtroom. Roy Whiting was quite a singular person. He was very scruffy, he was something of a loner. We do know that he'd briefly been married and he had a child. He'd lived in fairly low circumstances. He'd been employed as a mechanic and motor vehicles were a feature throughout his life. He'd taken up sort of low-level racing at one point but hadn't been particularly successful. During his trial, it was revealed that Whiting had already served a four-year prison sentence for abducting a nine-year-old. He was well known to the police. In fact, he was one of the first persons to go on the sex offenders register. It took the jury four weeks to deliver a unanimous verdict of guilty. He was sentenced to life. The judge recommended that he should never be released from prison. The taking of any human life is tragic enough, but the abduction and murder of a child does seem to touch us all. One of the most profoundly upsetting cases took place on the Yorkshire Moors in 1975. Ronald Castry, a taxi driver, picked up a young girl off the street for sex and stabbed her to death in a crime for which an innocent man served 16 years in jail. Castry was arrested 31 years after the killing of 11-year-old Leslie Molseed, when samples preserved from the remote moorland murder scene were matched to his DNA. Castry was in fact arrested for something which never came to court. Routinely a DNA swab was taken and all of a sudden uh, the alarm bells started ringing when that uh, DNA swab was put through the database. The um Clothed tapings that, that, that were taken uh, from from the pieces of evidence, uh, which had uh, sperm heads, etc., and these um, gave a full DNA profile that matched that of Ronald Castry. When the case came to court, the jury heard not only the damning DNA evidence, but confirmation of Castry's unnatural interest in young girls. In the course of proving the charge, the prosecution had in fact been able to bring evidence of a further abduction of a young girl, which fortunately didn't result in a death, which had taken place two years after Leslie's abduction and murder. When Ronald Castry stabbed Leslie Molseed to death, 
he began a course of events which were to destroy a second innocent life. As well as murdering the child, he stayed silent as a blameless man, Stefan Kishko, a tax clerk, was convicted of the killing. There are really two tragedies in this case. One, of course, was the tragedy of the death of Leslie, and the other was the tragedy of Stefan Kishko being imprisoned for 16 years for a crime he plainly didn't commit. Kishko was cleared on appeal in 1990, after it was proved he was impotent and could not have been responsible for sperm found on Leslie's clothing. Stefan Kishko came out of prison essentially a broken man and died shortly thereafter, as did his mother. I know from talking to Leslie's mother uh, and other members of the family that what happened to Stefan Kishko is, is an aggravating factor in their own emotional distress. In 2007, Castree was jailed for life and told by the judge that he would not be paroled for 30 years. This means that he will more than likely die in prison. Leslie Molseed and Sarah Payne were both abducted by strangers and then very quickly killed. David, it's the case, isn't it, that if a child isn't found within the first 48 hours, they're very unlikely to be found alive. It is unfortunate, but from past precedent and police experience, that most children who have been abducted post that period are usually deceased, have usually been murdered on the spot, as it were. Um, and it is also a crucial factor that the police have to be able to manage this situation with grieving relatives around them, with a the public that are interested, uh, and they have to kind of project the idea that they are still looking for living people on the off chance that these children may be alive, um, and secretly they are often already looking for bodies, um, almost covertly. I'm not sure that's entirely true, because it's about how the police deal with it initially. If they deal with it as a critical incident, and by that I mean the homicide working uh, policy in relation to dealing with missing persons and, and young children, is that they deal with it as a major incident. They will deal with it in relation to it, the worst case scenario, and they'll apply the resources to be able to look at that. So from the very beginning, they'll put everything in it, into it as though it was a major inquiry. Um, so f they're very open and very clear to the family. Of course, they'll be constantly looking for a child that's alive until such time as there's evidence to suggest that they're dead. But there's no secrecy made about that. We know from some fairly recent research that children who are abducted tend to be female, by and large. They tend to be murdered very quickly, as we've said, but then left in the same place as where they were killed. They tend to have been sexually assaulted also. Are there any similarities when we actually look at the perpetrators, David? There can be similarities between, you know, people who offend against children and people that kill children. Um, but unfortunately, there are some radical differences as well. Um, you know, that you have people who are primarily interested sexually in children. There are people who are, who are kind of predators of children, um, who um, only want to abuse them or, or to bully them. Uh, and and uh, possibly um, you've alluded to, um, there are people who, as it were, learn that these are the easiest targets and individuals to manipulate uh, and therefore, you know, sort of um, utilise, but not necessarily for sexual purposes. However, you know, there are common characteristics in that they do tend to be extremely manipulative, ex excellent liars, very good at covering up their tracks. Um, they are almost universally, to some degree, loners, odd people who do not fit in with the rest of society. So to some degree, they do kind of identify themselves within communities. I mean, the reason why they're sexually abused is we're talking about predatory paedophiles here. Those are the people that abduct children, and they abduct children, and then they sexually abuse them. What other purpose is there to abduct a child at four years old? What value will they give you? other than from sexual gratification, and that is why they get sexually abused. You do get people who primarily want to bully uh, and manipulate and control a child, uh, sometimes without sexual purposes, because, if you like, that is the sexuality of the person. Power and control become come but well before stranger, sexual... But not from a stranger's point of view, to abduct a child. It I can't can think be. of it. it can there be. are very few strangers who abduct children with other than sexual Other than the sexual I mean, what was the point of abducting a child other than to... Someone I mean, you can I, overpower and bully, what? control and, and kill. And then return them back home. No. Just to stop you for a second, when I assess child abusers, 
I look at two things. I think that every offence against a child has two elements. One is sexual motivation, so sexual gratification, but also these offences meet some type of emotional need, don't they? In terms of Leslie Molseed, she was stabbed 11 times. If she'd simply been sexually abused and then needed to be got rid of quickly, instrumentally, just to be expedited, why use such such rage. At that time, he wanted to kill her and there's sexual gratification. Maybe he got sexual gratification from killing her in that manner. That was a decision that he took. But what we must say is that the end result was that she died. The means that he did it was by using a knife, but it was as a result of her being sexually abused by him. Ultimately, it was forensic evidence that trapped Ronald Castry so many years after the offence and also that's what convicted Roy Whiting. Now it cost two million pounds to prosecute Roy Whiting. Now many people will say that that was money really well spent but how could we have spent that mark actually in an attempt to avoid him having gone on to kill Sarah? It comes back to the argument is these people who present a risk should they be in the community there is no doubt that Whiting um, Huntley, um, Castry, these presented a risk, you know, in relation to Castry, you know, he'd abducted a child immediately after, you know, he'd already was in, in that abusing stage. Whiting had previously abducted a child and held her at knife point. These are people who shouldn't be in society. They were allowed to be in society, they went on to kill. So, two million pounds, ten million pounds, whatever it costs as far as investigation, that's money well spent. The sad reality is, is these individuals who present a risk should not be in community in the first place. That is a very difficult situation to handle. Um, you have two problems compounded here. One is the obvious identification of people who are likely to offend against children. They do show, don't they, almost a, a classic career trajectory. Yeah, like I mean, it, it, what, one this wasn't someone who was yeah, likely. One, These were offenders. They, they had already had offenders. offenders. But there are many other people out there who are kind of on the sub-threshold. But, but, um, but, but, but hang on, for the first time, you don't suddenly start killing, right? There is, not, there is not one single child killer out there who is a predatory paedophile who has never committed a sexual offence previously to a child and has been aware Absolutely of the local authority. Absolutely not, no, because okay. there's no way... So therefore, way, yeah. fantasy in relation to whether or not you're going to commit offences is irrelevant. In no, no, what I'm talking about is the fact that these people don't always come to the attention because they commit individual, noticeable, prosecutable offences. The certainty you have when someone has a pattern of behaviour throughout their life, and in retrospect, we usually do find all this um, after the event. And, and unfortunately, what we need to do is turn things around so that we have the ability to detect this before the event. And the problem is, if you identify them in communities so that people are aware of them, they are vilified and, and, and thrown from those communities and go underground. So you, you do end up with a large, a large number of people, um, as there are a large number of people on sex offender registers, um, who are, as it were, still in the community but being monitored. Well, the think... danger is to identify them publicly. I think that there's a strong argument to say that actually in all of these cases they were accidents waiting to happen. Ian Huntley was certainly an accident waiting to happen. After the break we'll take a look at the trial and the aftermath of the murders of Holly and Jessica. The disappearance of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman prompted one of the biggest police operations that the UK had ever seen. Thirteen days after they first went missing School caretaker Ian Huntley was arrested on suspicion of murder. On the 17th of August 2002, Huntley was taken into police custody. He was formally charged with the killing of both girls and sectioned under the Mental Health Act, pending a hearing to establish if he was fit for trial. The moment he was arrested and cautioned, he never said a word. And he arrived in custody at Huntingdon Police Station, and in fact he was described by the custody staff as a gibbering wreck, and to all intents and purposes had had a complete mental breakdown. I have no doubt that there was absolutely nothing wrong with him at that time, and this was a, a, an attempt to avoid having to give an account of what had happened until he had seen uh, the weight of the evidence against him when he got to trial. Carr was arrested for assisting an offender 
as well as conspiring to obstruct the course of justice, as she had initially provided Huntley with a false alibi for the time of Holly and Jessica's disappearance. The trials of Huntley and Carr opened to worldwide media interest. In court, the jury heard that there was overwhelming evidence that Huntley had murdered the girls and then tried to cover his tracks. I gave evidence on one day in, uh, during the trial. I could see Huntley from where I was and at one point looked at him. I was so angry with the man really, and, um, but he, there was no eye contact coming back. Witnesses testified that they'd seen Huntley washing and vacuuming his car soon after the girls had gone missing. Despite Huntley's attempts to destroy forensic evidence, extensive hair and fibre residues remained. It was this that linked Huntley to the murder of the girls. The defence called Huntley as their first witness. He described how he had accidentally knocked Holly into the bath whilst helping her to control a nosebleed. And he had unintentionally suffocated Jessica when she started to scream. He went to trial and made the admissions that the girls had died in the house. He was the only adult present, uh, and it was all a terrible accident. But he was forced into that position because of the weight of evidence against him. After three days on the stand, Huntley stepped down and Carr's testimony began. Carr had claimed that she was in the house with Huntley at the time the murders happened, but she was visiting relatives in Humberside at the time phone records proved this. Her lawyer acknowledged that Carr had lied to protect her lover. The exposure of this lie was of critical importance in convicting Huntley. I think the reason that Maxine Carr gave Huntley an alibi was, well, as she stated, she simply couldn't believe that uh, Huntley was capable of killing two young girls. After five days of deliberation, Carr was cleared of assisting an offender, but found guilty of perverting the course of justice and jailed for three and a half years. Well, it was put to her in her final interview that we had evidence that proved that Huntley was responsible for killing uh, the two girls. Uh, and uh, she took that quite badly and broke down uh, in tears in the interview. But then by the time she came to court, she was far more stoical and... Um, uh, it was evident that by then they had completely broken off all communication and uh, it was a case of survival of the fittest when they came to court. The jury rejected Huntley's claims that the girls had died accidentally and returned a majority verdict of guilty. Huntley was given a 40-year prison sentence. Carr was freed under police protection in May 2004 and given a new identity. Huntley is unlikely ever to be released. Whilst in prison, Ian Huntley attempted to commit suicide, taking 29 antidepressant tablets that he'd hidden in a box of tea bags. David, do you think that this was just a last ditch attempt at getting out of his bad situation? When they realise that not only are they, are they convicted, not only are they going to be in prison, but the chances are they're never, ever going to get out of prison. At that point, many um, people in his position uh, do turn to suicide. He's tried to kill himself because in, in prison, these individuals, is they don't have a life. He's in isolation. He's kept away from the rest of the prisoners. There is no life that he has anymore. You know, he doesn't mix with any of the other prisoners because of his own, kept for his own safety. So, and that's why lots of people where there's a prison regime, where there isn't the interaction between other prisoners with members of staff, where the interaction is very poor, there is a greater chance of people committing suicide. Well, I know from working in prisons that there is a real hierarchy amongst inmates mm. and the lowest of the low are child sex offenders. Most prisoners, as with we've seen with other cases, uh, will see it as a status thing to have a go at him if they get an opportunity to, or to intimidate him at least. So his life, looking at it, would be hell. And perhaps one way out would be to make, commit suicide, but the other way out would be to manipulate the situation and place himself into greater safety or amongst people that he could then manipulate. Well, he's looked down upon, not just by other inmates, but he's looked down upon by the entire nation. Do you think that the way in which child sex offenders are vilified is in fact somewhat disproportionate. 
it's absolutely disproportionate. It, it's quite a scary situation, and, we, and it takes a very brave person really to speak out against it. Um, we are fiercely overprotective of children in this particular country, and it, and it is an unfortunate thing that by becoming um, highly uh, vilified by the population, that these people then will, will find themselves um, more a greater necessity to manipulate situations, to lie convincingly, to evade the justice system as long as they can, and, and to manipulate, as Huntley possibly was doing, um, within prison systems. Um, they become You're saying, you're saying their own we vilify enemy. sex offenders and, and people that commit offences against children. You're saying, therefore, that, that some of the offences they commit aren't that bad? No, I'm not saying that they're not, that they're not bad. I'm saying they are equal, to some degree, to those um, involving adults people still die. And the fact that we keep telling ourselves no children are worth more is simply ageist. I mean, children are the future of where we have to go, and children are vulnerable in their very nature, aren't they? In my view, any abuse and any taking of a life is just appalling. We do have to protect vulnerable groups in society. So, arising from the Huntley case, what do we do now to protect children? Well, Huntley in particular in relation to Sarah Payne and obviously the murder of Sarah Payne that there's been called for Sarah's law and basically that means is to enable the public to police themselves to be able to be aware of who the sex offenders are living in the community but what we must remember is that had this law Sarah's law been around that would not have stopped Roy Whiting from killing Sarah Payne Roy Whiting did not live in the area where Sarah Payne was abducted and murdered. Therefore, they would not have known that he was going to be that proximity on that day. Well, I think that a law allowing the public to know where convicted sex offenders live is something that I'm absolutely against. But do you think there can be an argument for it, David? The net result of the kind of Sarah's law approach is that quite simply, if you have offenders who are identified to the community as well as the police, those offenders go underground, they hide, they do a runner, they don't want to be attacked and, and, and spat on, they don't want to be treated in that way, therefore they go off the register, um, they, they disappear from, from the, the radar of the police and we don't know what happens then because we have no means of tracking them. So basically it's we counterproductive. It hasn't there was a call for Sarah's law on the back of Sarah being murdered. News of the World started to publish details of sex offenders living in communities. Paul's Grove in Portsmouth was an area which became aware of where these uh, sex offenders were. They had vigilantism and it created a massive issue. And that is a small area as a result of one campaign. If you use that across the whole of the country and everyone's aware, we'll have exactly the same vigilantism that sits in Paul's Grove as sits elsewhere. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, David. As a psychologist, I get to interview child sex abusers, sadly, very often. Parents should always be aware of who's around their children, but they should also be aware that the murder of a child is exceptionally rare.